Well, I can tell you it has been my joy to be with you, to learn from you, to listen to you, to go home and to pray more pointedly for you, knowing your, your needs, hearing your stories. Let me ask you to do one thing for me, and then we're going to get into the Word. For years, every place I went, all over the world, every church I preached in, I asked the folks to pray for my parents. I would have done that when I was here with Ab 10 the first time. I always did that. God ultimately answered those prayers after 36 years of praying for my dad, 47 years of praying for my mom. So now when I travel, I now ask folks to pray for my sister, whose name is Sherry, and for a buddy of mine who is, uh, the Lord has not given us children, but this, this young man has become a son to me. Uh, his name is George. Uh, I love him like a, like a son. Uh, he is not following the Lord, not even close. And every place I go, I ask folks to pray for him. And so would you do me this favor and write those names down? And then even in the time when we uh, move into our breakout time, our response time, if you would pray for those two folks, I, I can't tell you how much joy it gives me and comfort it gives me to know that my African brothers and sisters are praying for these two persons in my life. So thank you for that. All right, our task this morning is to talk about the power of missional theological education, and that is the reality that we must rely on the Spirit. And I want to do this in a way that is, is perhaps uh, unexpected, but in a way that helps me to think about why we must rely on the Spirit. And I really want to take you to a challenge uh, as I finish my time with you. Something that I have thought about a lot, and this, this really is an opportunity for me to, to speak what is heavy on my heart with regard to theological education. So I want to do this. I want to go back to where we started. We started a few days ago looking at the New Testament passages that call us to the Great Commission. I want to walk through those again and help you see those in a little different way today. So go back with me to Matthew 28. And let's start there. I want to show you another pattern that we find in all of these texts. We talked about the fact that we must make disciples, that we must make disciples among the nations, that, that we must proclaim the word. We must do this because it's Jesus who commands us to do this. But then I want to show you something else that we learn about the disciples and about the promise of God in all of these contexts. So let's start in Matthew 28, this time in verse 16. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped. But, and here's what the text tells us, some did what? Tell me. Some doubted. Some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you how long? Always to the end of the age. Now, here's what I want you to see. In this picture of the Great Commission passage, the text tells us that some worshiped and some doubted. Now, scholars differ about the number of followers who were there on the mountain. We know the 11 disciples were there. I suspect there were others there as well. Some argue that this may have been the place where Jesus appeared to, to 500. Scholars also differ about why those doubted, why they doubted. Maybe it was because they hadn't seen anything quite like resurrection before, but for whatever reason it was, some there were doubting. But Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. Some worshipped, some doubted, but Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. It shouldn't surprise us, you know, that some that anybody doubted. Because think about those 11 disciples who were left there. Did they always follow Jesus closely? Not always. Did they always listen to Jesus? Not always. Sometimes they failed in ministry. 
They tried to cast a demon out. They couldn't do it. They all said that they would die for Jesus, and yet they all fled when Jesus was arrested. And meanwhile, even when they're failing in ministry, what are they arguing about? Do you remember? They're always arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. They are failures who are arguing about who great, how great they are. But Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. Now, why does he do that? Because of this promise at the end. Remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. They doubted. Jesus gave the commission to them anyway. Why did he do that? Because the fulfillment of the commission wasn't dependent upon those men. It was dependent upon the presence of the Son of God with them. And he gave them this promise. I'll be with you always. Go to Mark 16. The last chapter of that book. Again, a portion of the, the book, the end of the book, that some debate uh, the ending of this book. But I want you to see again what we read in this, this particular ending. We're picking up in verse 9 this time. Mark 16, verse 9. I want you to see a similar pattern. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet, look at verse 11, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they what? Did not believe it. After this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported it to the rest, who did not believe them either. Keep reading, verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. All right, now just stop there. They did not believe. They did not believe. They did not believe. Are these the people to whom you would give the Great Commission? I don't think so. But here's what we read in verse 15. Then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. But Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. And we read the rest of this chapter, and I remind you again, there's a debate about the, the chapter, but the rest of this chapter talks about signs and power that God gives to people. That they don't do this on their own. The reason he can call even doubters to do the work of the Great Commission is because he empowers them to get it done. Go to Luke 24. Luke 24, Jesus walking with disciples on the road to Emmaus who had been arguing and struggling about what had happened in Jerusalem, questioning what had happened. Then look at verse 25 of Luke 24. Listen to what Jesus said to them. He said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. How foolish and slow you are to believe. Go to verse 36, same chapter. As they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. He said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? It's the same picture. But Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. So look with me at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And here's the Great Commission. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. 
You are witnesses of these things. Now, keep reading. Listen to this. Why would Jesus call these people to do the work of the Great Commission? Verse 49 says, And look, I am sending you what my Father promised. As for you, stay in this city until you are empowered from on high. Why does he trust them with this work? Because he will give them power from on high. It's not because they are ready to do it. It's because he empowers them. Let me show you this in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And let's pick up in verse 19. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. So look at that. Here are Jesus' followers locked in a room, driven, compelled by fear, stuck in their fear. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Apparently they needed to hear that more than once. Peace to you. And then here's the commission. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Cowering disciples, hiding behind the door. And Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Why would he do that? Look at verse 22. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Again, scholars debate all that's going on here. It's likely a foreshadowing of what would happen in Acts chapter 2. But what I want you to see again is this. Frightened disciples, Jesus gives them the commission anyway. And why does he do that? Because he's no, he knows he's going to breathe the Holy Spirit on them. And he will empower them. Go to Acts chapter 1. Beginning in verse 4. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which we had just read in Luke 24, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So here's the promise of the Spirit. Now watch where the disciples are. So when they come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Jesus had promised them power for the mission. And where is the heart of the disciples? It's still on a political Messiah who will establish the kingdom of Israel. Their heart is leaning differently. Not a surprise to us. This is the story of these disciples. You know what they're doing? They're thinking about political power, and Jesus is about to say, I'm going to give you power, but it's not the power you're thinking about. Their heart still isn't where it ought to be. And Jesus says this in verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods, that the Father is set by his own authority. Here's what he says. Jesus says, don't worry about that. But he gives them the commission again. He gives them the commission anyway. Why? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. They're thinking earthly kingdom. But Jesus gives them the Great Commission anyway. Why does he do that? Because he knows he's about to send the Holy Spirit to fall upon them. Relying on the power of the Spirit to do the work. What do we learn from this quick review of these texts? Here's the first thing that we learned. These disciples were a mess. They really were. Sometimes I use the word knucklehead for them. They didn't always listen. They didn't always follow. They didn't always understand. But Jesus gave them the Great Commission anyway. 
And I don't know that that always makes sense to us, why he would do that. In fact, Craig Ott and others in their book, Encountering Theology of Mission, they, they conclude this. Let me just read it to you. They speak of this call of these disciples to do the work of the Great Commission, and they say this. This was truly a staggering proposition that would verge on the ridiculous were it not for the accompanying authority and promise of the risen Christ who gives the commission. Let me, let me say it to you again. They write, this would verge on the ridiculous that Jesus would give this task to these men. Now, let me just say to you before we move farther, we're not unlike these disciples. You and I are like them. And if we think we're not, we may have just admitted that we are. And I say that to say, if it verged on the ridiculous for Jesus to call these men to do this work, it still verges on the ridiculous that God chooses to use any of us either. And the only reason, the only reason we are empowered to do what we do is because God fills us with his spirit. Well, there's a second thing that I think we learn from these texts. This focus on the Spirit, we hear it every time we read this, this picture of the, the Great Commission, this promise of the power of God. What's God saying to us when he says, I'm going to empower you? Here's what he's saying to us. I'm calling you to a task that you can't do. That's why he says, I'm going to empower you. I'm calling you to a task that you can't get done. Were it not for the power of God in the lives of the disciples and the power of God in our lives, we could not do what God has called us to do. Uh, consider why that is. Think about what God's called us to do. He's called us to take the gospel to non-believers, to the nations, to all the peoples of the world, people who apart from Christ, here's what the scriptures tell us, they are dead in their trespasses and sins according to Ephesians 2. They are blinded by the God of this age, according to 2 Corinthians 4. They are living in the domain of darkness, according to Colossians 1. They are caught in the devil's trap, according to 2 Timothy 2. They are living under the power of Satan, in darkness, according to Jesus, in his calling of the Apostle Paul in Acts 26, as Paul gives his testimony. So here they are. We're trying to reach people who are dead, blinded, in darkness, caught in the devil's trap, and under the power of Satan. And you and I cannot do that in our own power. And then God calls us to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. And that is that God is using us as vessels, as vehicles through whom he is conforming others to the image of Christ, making them more and more Christ-like as they learn to obey him, everything he has commanded. And you and I can't do that either. We can't do the evangelism. We can't do the equipping apart from the power of God. We must have the Spirit in this work. We must have the Spirit of God who does so many things for us, who carried along men, who spoke from God as they wrote Scripture, this Spirit who guides us into all truth, this Spirit who leads us day by day as we live according to the Spirit, this Spirit who convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment and who prepares the harvest for us, this Spirit who grants us new life when we are born again in the Spirit, this Spirit who seals us for the day of redemption, this Spirit who gives us spiritual gifts to serve God through His church, this Spirit who reminds us what to say when we find ourselves under threat, this Spirit who is still drawing people to God from every tribe and language and nation and people, and this Spirit who leads us along the way and who comforts us in our struggles, and this Spirit who prays for us when we don't know how to pray. You and I must have the Spirit to get the work done God has called us to do. Amen. We can't do this work apart from God's power. So this forces us to ask the question, to determine, are we, as we do missional theological education, are we operating in our own strength 
or in God's strength? Are we operating in the power of the Spirit or in our power? And I want to take you to two Old Testament texts. And this is, this is the challenge. This is the challenge of my heart. And these, these texts just grip me every time I look at them. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is the story of David and Goliath. You know this story. The shepherd boy. We're introduced to this giant who is nine feet, nine inches tall. His armor weighs 125 pounds. The, the head of his spear weighs 15 pounds. Nobody will fight him. The Israelite army refuses to come against him. Three times in this chapter we read about David who is but a boy. Three times he's identified as young. We read of him, he's one who's tending sheep, going back and forth to, to do so. And yet he's the one who agrees to take on the giant. Saul says, you can't do that. And David says, no, that's not the case. Because the God who's taking care of me with the lions and the bears in my yesterdays, he will take care of me with the giant today. And here's what, here's what David says. Go with me to verse 46. Well, let's pick up in verse 45. When David speaks to the Philistine, I can just see this story. David, the shepherd boy, he has to be looking up at the giant. He has to be. So I can see the giant just, just towering over him and David looking up at this, this giant. And here's what he says. Verse 45, you come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin. Because that's the way human beings fight. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. So don't miss that. God led David into this impossible situation so that the world may know that Israel has a God. There's a missiological focus behind this. And that this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is whose? The Lord's. He will hand you over to us. And what David echoes here is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. The Hebrews cross the Red Sea and they begin to sing together about God. And they said, the Lord is a warrior. He's our warrior. He's our warrior. And David knows that. God's the one who fights the battle for us. But then go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. We read again about David, but this time it's not David the shepherd boy, it's David the king. The shepherd boy said, this battle is not mine, it is the Lord's. Chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles, verse 1. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel, to take a census. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring a report to me so I can know their number. Joab knows this is wrong. He's reading David's heart. So he confronts him. Joab replied, may the Lord multiply the number of his people a hundred times over. My Lord, the king, aren't they all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? Yet the king's order prevailed over Joab. So Joab left and traveled throughout Israel and then returned to Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see in verse 5 who gets reported. It's not all the people. Joab gave the total troop registration to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 armed men, and in Judah itself, 470,000 armed men. Who, who gets reported? It's the warriors. It's the army. So apparently this is what David wanted to know. So what did he want to know? Just how mighty his forces were. Just how big his kingdom is. 
just how much power he has, how much authority he has, how many people have his back. And God is so displeased with David's actions that he sends a plague on the entire nation of Israel. Now, what's the problem here? Who was supposed to be their warrior? God is. And why is this such a sin for David in particular? Think with me. Why is it such a sin for David in particular to say, I want to know how mighty my forces are. I want to know how strong my army is. You know why? Because David knew better. Why did David know better? Because he was the shepherd boy who said, the battle is not mine, it is the Lord's. Now here's what I want you to see. When David is the shepherd boy, here's who he is. As a shepherd boy, he just trusts God. If God says you take some stones and you take on a giant, you just do it. Because God said, do it. You just follow. You may not understand it all. You may not be trained. You just do what God tells you to do. And as the shepherd boy, that's what he does. He marches into the conflict, trusting that God is going to take care of him. And he leans on God and he says with integrity and he says rightly, this battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. He gets it. But then watch what happens let him grow up a little bit. Let him get some training under his belt. Let him get some weaponry at his side. Let him get some people who report to him. Give him a position. Give him a title. And he who relied on God as the shepherd boy relies on himself as the king. Now here's why I want us to think about that. That's our story. I remember the days early in ministry when I prayed through every single word I preached, saying, Lord, please just don't let me be stupid today. <laughs> Lord, don't let me fall up the steps or down the steps. Or the first time I walked into a classroom, Lord, I'm so excited to be here, but I can't do this. Or the first time I try to put together an exam, Lord, I don't I think this is right, but you're going to have to help me. As a pastor, the first time I baptized somebody, I'd never baptize anybody. God, I don't want to drown him, so help me. Or I'm leading a business meeting. Lord, I don't even want to do this. I certainly don't know how to do this. You have to do this through me. Or a counseling session. Lord, I don't know how to help this person. God, you have to do it. And early for us in our ministries, whether in pastoral roles or in professor roles, we learn God has to do this. And we're excited that he does as we rely on the Spirit, but here's what happens. Give us some experience and give us some training and give us a title. Call us doctor. Give us letters behind our name. Give us some authority. Give us some students who look up to us. And it's really easy to become David the king. And we try to do missional theological education in our own power, and it doesn't work that way. Where are you in your own walk with the Lord? Be honest. Are you... More David the king or David the shepherd boy? Relying on self or relying on the power of God through the spirit of God? And I remind you again that if your answer is, you know, I just want everyone to know I'm David the shepherd boy and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> you just admitted you're the king. Because we all become the king. And here's my tension Here's my tension as an educator. This is where I want to leave you to think about this. We live in this tension. We, we want our students to be the best equipped students they can be. We want to produce, all of us, I know this, all of you in your institutions, you want to produce the best graduates you can produce. You, right? 
You want them. You want them to know the scriptures well. You want them to teach with the authority of God. You want them to understand how to relate to people, how to shepherd people. You want them to recognize how history helps us navigate today's issues. You want them to know how to share the gospel. You want them to know how to make disciples. You want them to know how to treat their own families and their congregations well. You want to equip them to their absolute best. Don't you? We all want that. So we want to drive our students in that direction. And it is right and it is proper for us to do that. But here's my fear. I live with this tension every day of my life. My fear is we're going to educate people out of dependence on God. Unless we who teach them teach out of hearts that are dependent on God. Unless they see in us Brothers and sisters who have a genuine, deeply felt dependence and reliance on God that guides our lives, not just when the mountain is too high to climb, but when we find ourselves on the top of the mountain and we still rely on the Spirit. And I think this danger is unique for professors too because we live in a world where we work toward title and people look up to us. So it's a danger for every one of us that we who need to stay the shepherd boy become David the king. I'll go back to what I said. It verges on the ridiculous that God would use any of us to do what we get to do. We just need to remember that. And ask God to make us the shepherd boy thoroughly reliant on the Spirit. So let's look at our questions that I want us to consider for just a few minutes. I want, you to, I want you to talk together about this, this personal question. As you evaluate your own life, are you more dependent on God's power or on your own power? It's just a question I think we have to answer. Question number two. How do you know when you're not relying on the Spirit? And if you're not sure what the answer to that is, ask somebody who knows you. <laughs> if you're married, ask your spouse. Other people know when you're not relying on the Spirit. Let them tell you. And here's the third question. This is the one I want to hear responses for. How might we practically help our students be strong graduates while also being leaders who stay on their knees in dependence? Here's, the, here's the, my dream. Here's the, something I would love to see someday is that in a graduation service, all of us who call names and give out diplomas, we would be on our knees because we know the only reason we get to be there is because of the grace and the power of God. And our graduates coming across the stage will come across the stage on their knees because they know the only reason they get to do what they do and cross this stage is because of the grace and the power of God. We may not do that physically, but we better do that internally. So how are we going to help our students do that? 